Well, I think uh, uh, the talk on pedicle, fi uh, pedicle screw fixation actually segues pretty nicely into this talk uh, in regards to posterior lumbar underbody fusion, the PLIF and the uh, transferaminal lumbar underbody fusion T lift. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Pat and Praveen for inviting me to give this presentation. Uh, can I ask how many people have done PLIFs here, uh, resident wise? Quite a few. I, I'm su actually surprised. I thought T lifts would be pretty popular. How many have done T lifts? So, definitely more. So, um, I, I think now these are very standard procedures. Uh, here are my disclosures. One second. Uh, that which don't have any bearing on this talk. So uh, why interbody fusion? Well, it preserves load bearing capacity. Uh, it facilitates compressive loading on bone. It can restore disc height. Definitely restore sagittal alignment. And combined with pedicle screw placement, stabilizes all three columns of the spine. And biomechanically, it's uh, definitely superior to posterior lateral fusion. It's definitely more rigid, particularly with uh, pedicle screw fixation. So uh, there are multiple options for interbody fusion now. Um, anterior lumbar underbody fusion, I, I think everybody's familiar with. Originally attributed to Southwick. The, the PLIF, uh, originally described by Cloward back in 1945, so 70 years ago, and uh, modified by Lynn uh, in the early 1970s, which made it become more popular. It was an easier method of doing it than Cloward's original technique. Transfer animal lumbar underbody fusion of T-LIF was really uh, popularized by Harms. It was, it was I, you know, in my opinion, a uh, modification of the PLIF. Uh, again, made it easier to do, I think, technically, and thus its popularity. Um, not for a lateral lumbar nerve fusion, I, I don't know if anybody exactly, I think Louis Pimenta is probably the one who's promoted the most, so I'm gonna attribute it to him, and I really couldn't tell with the axial lift, and I'm not entirely sure if people still do them. Um, so we're gonna really focus on the PLIF and the T-LIF. So, you know, I always like looking back in history, I, I think, uh, and this is one of Cloward's original articles uh, on PLIF, and it was published in 1953, Journal of Neurosurgery. Uh, Cloward, you know, popular for the ACDF2, and we use a, typically the Smith-Robinson technique, but Cloward had an ACDF technique as well. And um, I didn't know he lived in Hawaii, but he did, so great place to live. And this is his original diagram, and as you can see here, um, he advocated, uh, you know, definitely a partial laminectomy, basically a complete facetectomy, and uh, retracted a drill sac uh, to allow uh, the view of the, uh, the posterior disc space here, and this is where the uh, autograph was implanted. And you can see, uh, you know, him doing the discectomy here with retraction. Uh, this is how he uh, did the inner body fusion. So he harvested cancellous bone from the other crest, and osteotome cuts to, to take three uh, basic plugs in the uh, wing. Uh, of the uh, iliac spine there, and then he just impacted it into the disc space. So this is 1945. I don't think we're much different now when, when we're doing PLIFs in general, uh, but really was not popular. And, and the reason why is, uh, if you look at Clower's original technique, he's doing complete facetectomies without any uh, sort of fixation. So there was a risk of spondylolisthesis with that. So you're creating PARS defects, essentially. And so Lin's technique was a modification. This was published in uh, neurosurgery back in 1972. Um, was not actually doing much of a facetectomy. So it, it was less surgery. Uh, and it's, in a way, it retracted nerve roots and dural sacs more, but without doing the facetectomy, there was less of a risk of, of a listhesis. So uh, it actually became more popular. Otherwise, it's very similar to Cloward's technique if you look at it. So, uh, you know, often PLIFs these days are combined with pedicle screw fixation and posterior lateral fusion, so you get a circumferential fusion, anterior and posterior, through a single... Um, uh, incision. And uh, ideally or optimally it's limited to the L3 to S1 levels. And again, it has to do with the amount of retraction of the dural sac. And this was one of the criticisms of this technique is the amount of dural retraction resulted in radiculitis from nerve root stretching or potentially even a nerve root injury. Spinal fluid leaks at the axilla of the nerve root were, were purportedly fairly common with this procedure. Um, and so it really wasn't recommended uh, above L3. Uh, TLF, uh, very similar to PLIF, allows circumferential fusion. Uh, but the advantage of PLIF, and this is purported advantage, is, is less or minimal thecal sac and nerve root retraction, which I think is true. You can perform at upper lumbar levels, even thoracic levels. There are, there are studies doing thoracic uh, lateral interbody fusion, basically a TLF version in the thoracic spine, just because you don't have to retract the dural sac very much. Uh, less scarring, less bleeding. It's a unilateral approach, so probably less bleeding in the epidural space. 
I think it's faster typically. You're only putting one implant in rather than two or three. Disadvantages or a cliff, um, I, I think you get less of a discectomy. Honestly, you're, from one side you're bleak. I, I don't think you do as good a job. And, and it is one cage place, but some people would argue two cages are more stable. So what are the indications? I, I think this is a, 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 out of a review article that was published a number of years ago. And I, I think acceptable, acceptable indications, high-grade spondees, degenerative scoliosis, I don't think these are common indications typically for t lifts or PLIFs. Uh, this, probably, this relative indication is probably the more common indication for a PLIF, t lift, low-grade spondees, recurrent disc herniations, degen disease. These contraindications, I, I think, are relative these days. I, I routinely do this operation with people who've had scarring or infection cases. Conjoined nerve roots, that, that's a challenge. So I, I definitely think that's a contraindication. But everything else here, severe disc space collapse, I, I really don't think it's a contraindication anymore. Uh, particularly with the current instrumentation techniques, which are modifications of t the original T-lift approach. So biomechanically, is there a difference in stability between the PLIF and T-lift? Um, there, there's been multiple studies looking at this. I just picked one of the more recent ones published in Journal of Neurosurgery uh, by the Stanford group. They took 40, 14 cadaveric specimens, seven of which uh, they did uh, essentially a single level T-lift at L4-5, consisting of a uh, right-sided uh, facetectomy. Whereas uh, compared it with the PLIF, again, L4-5 with partial facetectomies, all of these were combined with pedicle screw fixation. So this is the testing. This is st pretty standard, you know, six degrees of uh, motion, axial rotation left, right, flexion extension, lateral bending left, right. Um, so these were the results. So when you look at it, this is 4-5, and the asterisk means statistically significant versus intact. So whether it's PLIF, which is a uh, black bar, and two gradations of T-lift. So this is a posteriorly implanted cage and an anteriorly implanted cage. They all were statistically more stable than the normal specimen, essentially, but not different amongst themselves. So only here, this is the uh, pound sign, where the PLIF was more stable, so lateral bending, uh, than T-lift. Uh, so uh, this is uh, looking at ro axial rotation. So, Better than the, the intact specimen, but uh, not any different between T-lift and PLIF. So when you look at this, they're significantly more rigid. It's not surprising against an intact specimen, whether it's PLIF or T-lift. The PLIF, by absolute numbers, was, was more stable than a T-lift, but only statistically significant lateral bending. Now, what does that mean? I mean, does, is that a clinically relevant finding? So, you know, when you look at the literature, it was, it was sort of surprising. PLIF has been around a long time. T-lift probably, you know, popular for a decade or so, but there's no really direct comparisons except this one study I found. So, and it was a retrospective comparative study, but really no other direct clinical comparative studies. And uh, published in the European Spine Journal in 2008, and they spelled PLIF wrong. And they go back and forth on doing that. <laughs> PELF, I don't know, but they definitely talking about PLIF. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, so it was retrospective. They actually had a fair number of patients, 176 patients, who underwent single-level interbody fusion for grade 1 or 2 degen spiny disease. And the groups are very, uh, fairly comparable, actually. N not statistically significantly different, whether uh, on demographic levels. And just L4-5, L5-S1. When you're looking at uh, mean follow-up, I, I think it was very reasonable. 29 months total for the whole group. And very similar between groups, to 29.5 versus 29.6. Uh, they looked at two outcome variables when it came to clinical outcomes. One was the pain index, which was just a VAS score, 0 to 10. And very similar preoperative baselines, and very similar, actually, almost exactly the same improvement between groups. Japanese Orthopedic Association score for back pain was very similar in, ter in terms of the degree of improvement, so no difference between groups. And this is the radiographic uh, comparison. This is the uh, improvement in spondylolisthesis rate. So this is like 30 versus 7.3. So actually a fairly uh, good improvement between the both uh, uh, types of procedures. So in terms of sagittal alignment improvement, very similar. Reduction rate, this is just a percentage. And again, the PILF here, I don't know, but they see PILF other places. The disc height restoration actually was much better. So they averaged about five millimeters of increased disc height with either procedure. So really no difference radiographically. Uh, they actually CT'd everybody. Everybody got CT, and the criteria for fusion was continuity of trabecular bone across the disc space. And they had the same fusion rates, 100% in both groups. Uh, complications. This was really what was surprising to me. The PLIF, apparently, you know, everybody says it has more risks, more complications because of uh, the amount of nerve retraction, but they really didn't have any statistically significant difference. At four in the PLIF group, three in the total, and three radiculitis, two radiculitis in the T-lift group. 
And the one other complication in each group was instrumentation, malpositioning, one of the pedicle screws were medial in either case. So very similar. So, so in conclusion, you know, both procedures had improved outcomes. There was no difference radiographically or clinically for both procedures. So I just want to talk about technique a little. And, and this um, slide summarizes everything. So the PLIF, more midline, straight in, T-lift, facetectomy, oblique cage. I just write diagram just shows it to you. And so this is, again, from that review paper. And you can see with typically with the PLIF, it's a, at least most people do a fairly good laminectomy. It's a lot of nerve retraction. Look at this. It's a ton of nerve retraction to get the cage in. Um, and it's cages these days, not um, autographed, typically. And um, you, know, you want to do a good discectomy here. And initially, you know, uh, these were threaded cylindrical cages that were just screwed in. And in my training, we, we did these. And I recall retracting the drill sack like crazy, because you had to go beyond midline, actually, because you wanted to be safe. You don't want to catch a dura and, and, and screw it in. And so a lot of retraction. This is pretty classic. But nowadays, you know, with uh, different cage technology, you're really probably talking about a peak cage as bulleted, self-distracting cages that are implanted, but these were the variety of cages that have been used for PLIFs. And this is probably what's done these days if you're going to do a PLIF. Uh, T-lift, very similar. Uh, really, the only difference is this facetectomy here, right? And I just wanted to show here, initially there were these rounded cages or rounded pieces of bone that were uh, placed obliquely and then pushed aside. A lot of effort, a lot of work. I've done this before. It's, it's much more work than, say, using a bleak cage, which is actually probably what the, is what the standard is right now. There are also banana cages where you uh, insert and then tilt and advance forward, so you get a more uh, disk space uh, distraction anteriorly, and you could compress and get more segmental lordosis. So there are a lot of options, but uh, you know, there's a, a lot of evolving technology that makes this technique, I, I think, simpler and you get better outcomes. So I, I just have a video, and hopefully it'll run. I think video is always kind of helpful. So this is a patient uh, we did, just grade one spondy, a good grade one. He moves a bit on flexion, and he's got you know high grade stenosis associated with it. So I mean, a T lift is very. This is a T lift example. It's very versatile. You know, with high grade stenosis that this guy, uh, this patient has, I would um, typically do a laminectomy with that. So you can see it's very high grade there. Uh, so combined with the laminectomy, it's a, actually a very straightforward procedure. And actually doing a facetectomy uh, makes the decompression a lot easier, particularly on the side of the facetectomy. So let me orient people. Oh, one second. You now the screws are put. I mean, this is pretty standard. You're, you're putting your pedicle screws in. And then for orientation purposes, this is cranial, caudal. This is right, left. And we're doing a right side T left. So that, you know, just remove the spinous process there, essentially. And I don't know if it, this projects well, but so basically a laminectomy um, has been mostly done, and we're going to make this transverse cut through the pars interticularis. So at L4-5, it's the L4 pars we're going to remove. And so all you do is essentially the laminectomy, make a transverse cut through the pars interticularis with the drill. You use an osteotome as well. It's fairly quick. So this is the pars right here. So remember, this is cranial, caudal, right side. We're just cutting through the pars here. And that disarticulates this inferior articulating facet. So the inferior facet of L4 is, can be removed fairly easily, and it can be removed in block. And we usually save it as autograph bone. So it's not a very long video, but you'll see. So the transverse cut is made. Now it's a mobile segment. That's the inferior facet being removed. And I think this is pretty standard. So it's a big knobby joint, a good autograph. And that's, this is the naked facet right here. So that's the superior facet of L5. And typically, you need to draw off the superior portion of it. You have to be careful if you drill too inferior, you'll drill into the L5 pedicle. Once you do that, you know, this is just showing the laminectomy. And it, this is pretty standard here. I wish I could maybe advance this a little bit. But it's not too long of a video. So then we do a complete discectomy. And I think it's, this is an important part of a T-lift, right? You shouldn't just put uh, a rotate shaver in a couple times and impact your cage. I mean, how you do your discectomy is gonna, it's going to be very important in terms of outcomes. The better the discectomy you do, the better the end plate preparation, I, I think is going to make a huge difference in, in terms of your outcome. So that's just ligamentum and laterally. But note, I, I, we're not going to have to retract at all. So here, here's uh, traversing nerve root right here, L5. There's a lateral edge of the thecal sac. Look how much room we have laterally. This is pretty standard for T lift. L5-S1, it's more, even more capacious. We just put a nerve root uh, retractor here just for protection, just in case we slip medially. But we're not retracting at all. Right? So hardly any retraction is required here. 
So just standard discectomy now. He's got a fairly, this is a fairly big disc. That's a rotate shaver that goes in. It breaks up the disc a little so you can make your, disc, uh, your discectomy a little easier. It's not much longer in the video. You, you can see the segment's pretty mobile now. You could distract pretty easily. But again, uh, taking time with your discectomy is, is very important. Sorry, I thought, uh, so once that's in, we're gonna impact your trowel in. Typically, you know, they start at eight millimeters. Pretty standard, eight millimeter trial. Self-distracting. So notice we're not using pedicle screw uh, to distract the disc space at all. I think uh, that tends to kyphose the spine. Sometimes you need to do it, but try not to. Because, you know, one important factor is you want to maintain your segmental lordosis here. So that's just a trial going in. And this is an expandable cage, so that's just a threaded expansion. And you can see, it definitely improved discite restoration. So just preoperative, definitely slippage. I think with, with the telefin, disc-based distraction, it's more segmentally lordotic there. Um, so. Um, I want to briefly talk about the pitfalls of T-lifts, I think. One of them, and this is a criticism that T-lift has, is because the entry into the disc space is narrow, a lot of times people will distract out the pedicle screws to open at disc space. You could, you know, do your discectomy and get a reasonably sized cage in. A lot of people try to go big, so we're in Texas, it go bigger, right? But that's true nationwide. A lot of people like to put a big cage in. I, th I think the problem with doing that is you can't compress enough. A lot of times you end up with kyphosis, so you may even start with lordotic, and then you end up neutral or even kyphotic, and there's a number of papers looking at that. Uh, or if you don't distract, you put an undersized cage, in, which subsides and it limits your disc height restoration, how much disc height you get. So that's a pitfall of a T-lift case, and it, it's, it's a, definitely a criticism. But, and so this is like an example of that. You start off 15 degrees of lordosis, and you end up with six after your a posterior base inner body. That's not uncommon. So I, I, I think one way, it, to prevent that is try not to distract off your pedicle screws. And I think that's feasible for in a lot of cases. And so use intradisco distraction. Ossetone is like my favorite instrument when it comes to these T-lifts. And sequential distraction, it mobilizes the disc space. And once you do that, whether you use an expandable cage or not, which I think is also important, you, you could maintain your segmental lordosis or improve upon it. And so I have multiple examples of this. So um, this is a, a patient back, bilateral leg pain, L5 radiculopathy, he has a good grade, I would call that a grade two spondy, L5-S1, complete disc space collapse, right? So uh, here's an example. So in, intraoperatively, this is an MIS procedure, so you can see the tube. I'm just going in with the osteotome. And the osteotome, once you get it in there, this is a distracting osteotome. You can distract the disc space. And you know, you've done a fast technique, it loosens things up. Then you, know, you could just use paddle distractors, do your discectomy, and here's the cage going in. This, is, this was an older case of mine, so I didn't have expandable, expandable cages weren't very common. But, you know, you can see here, you still got the slippage, but using the reduction capability of the screw extenders, you can reduce it completely. And then you're left with, you know, good disc cut restoration, and you reduce the spondylolisthesis. And this is him a uh, year out. You can see the bridging bone. Clinically, he did fine. And I'll give you a, a bigger example of this, right? So this is a patient. She had a pre-existing fusion when she was younger. She's 33, right? But her real problem is here at 5-1. This is a good grade 3, borderline grade 4 spondy, right? You can see the lumbosacral angle here. And I, I think, you know, osteotomes and uh, sequential distraction is important here, right? You can address this with a T-lift. That's what I did here in an example here, right? So you can see the spawning. She's got a grade three here. So I'm using a curved osteotome because you're basically, it's hard to tell here, but you're basically almost horizontal with this osteotome trying to get in. Um, and so, you know, I put L4 LAX screws and L5S1 uh, screws in. And just, here's the video, so you know, you use an osteotome, you do the, on either end of the spine, so this is not a T-lift, it's like both, I mean, either end, you want to loosen it up, so I'm not going to show all that. But, so the osteotome goes in, and the segment's fairly mobile now. Then you put a paddle distractor in, you sequentially distract this, right? So you're getting distraction, you're pretty ventral here. Remember, the vessels are going to be in front of the five body. Then you can start to reduce, this is a reduction screw, um, set, uh, screw. And you're reducing it back, and you're improving this lumbosacral angle here. And then, you know, that's 
decent, but you have the other side. You know, I've already reduced off one side. This is a distracting ostrich that goes in because I'm trying to get a cage in, right? And so this ends up being a six millimeter cage that goes in, not, not that high, but enough to get a cage in. And then you can distract off the other end, and you end up, you end up with this as a final. It's mostly reduced now, and you've improved the lumbosacral angle quite a bit. Here's a CT. It looks like a pretty good reduction there. And here's the pre, so you can see the lumbosacral angle. It's almost vertical here. And you can see it's, it's almost erotic here. And her, her sagittal balance was improved. And it wasn't horrible to begin with, but it's much better. Um, so uh, I want to talk about expandable cages, too. I, I think besides an osteotome use, uh, uh, these are very helpful, too. Because if this space is narrow, right, you don't want to pound a disc space in. I don't want to distract. So you undersize expandable cage in, and, you just, and it expands into the area that you can compress beyond it, right? So it makes it a lot easier. So just an example, this went in. Unexpanded, I'm expanding it, and you can see it expands to the end plates. Then you can compress, and look, so this is segmentally lordotic with diskite restoration. She started mildly kyphotic here. Right, so with TLF, we're, we're getting diskite restoration and segmental lordosis. Just another example, 5 1 becomes always an issue, right? This is not horrible, but it's collapsed. He's got bilateral pars defects here. Same type of deal, and I got multiple examples of this. You undersize the cage going in, but you get 5 1, it wedges open like crazy, right? So this is either a 10 or 15 degree lordotic cage that goes in and you expand the area, right? It contacts the end plates, you get segmental lordosis. And here's a pre and a post. So a lot of discrete restoration, segmental lordosis there. Right. So, you know, in summary, I, I think both cliff and T lifts are, uh, are clinically, at least based on the studies, they're very comparable in terms of outcomes. And I, I think, I, I'm a T lift person, so I'm biased. Uh, I think it's typically less time intensive, uh, less, definitely less dural sac and nerve root traction. I showed you that video. And it really can be performed at any level in the lumbar spine. Uh, that's it. Happy to answer any questions. Yeah.